is in order to convert individuals, you must initially reach them where they currently are rather than where you want to take them. To explain how I learned this and how it's working, how it worked for me, I have to take you back to my early days when I was first appointed president of the Appalachian Mountain Club. That was my dream job. So I was really very excited about it and really appreciated it when people came up and congratulated me. But then there was the incident in the Logan Airport where a old friend of mine, a former Peace Corps friend came up to me and said, Andy, congratulations. I hear you just been appointed to the largest dating organization in the Northeast. I said, the largest dating organization in the Northeast. Um, I didn't say, what do you mean? Instead, I was so taken aback or slightly insulted that I um, just sort of walked off. And then over time, I learned that there couldn't have been a better characteristic, a better compliment. I learned that so many individuals who might never have been interested in outdoor activities, who might never have been interested in appreciating the wilderness, people who wouldn't have thought of themselves as conservationists were attracted to the woods, were attracted to the trails with their partners they met through AMC activities they not only ended up in chapter activities, but they often were together up in the White Mountains in other AMC and related activities. And so in the end, they really became conservationists, whether they were willing to admit it or not. And so I felt here was a characteristic where Basically, we were originally not proactively, but because of what the organization was all about, we were reaching people from where they were. And over time, we were able to convince them to end up where we were. That's it. Any questions? Andy, this is Rick Gordon. Did you uh, have you hiked the Appalachian Trail, the AT? <laughs> um, well, you first have to understand, as a lot of people here um, may know, that I had the most inappropriate background for um, running the AMC as possible since I grew up in Indiana. Never saw a mountain until I was 18. Um, so in other words, the answer to your question is no. <laughs> But I, I probably over time um, managed to, uh, to hike uh, two or 300 miles of it. So I, I gained credibility over time. It's um, interesting though, that um, since um, I'm talking about the, um, the largest dating organization in the Northeast, um, um, I, I think there's a, a pretty good record that when couples try together to, to hike the, AM, the, um, the AT, they very seldom end up uh, completing the trail together. <laughs> Anyone else have questions for Andy? Let me make one um, final comment uh, for those of you who read the, um, the update on um, the town of Lincoln's new um, conservation director, um, Michelle said in her bio that the way she met her husband was through the AMC. And it did um, remind me that one failure I had with this concept of feeling like um, it was a, a great place for 
couples to, to get together is um, when so many of them, or at least a lot of them, ended up actually married to each other. I felt on those um, marriage celebration, there should have been a requirement that in, instead of getting presents, all the gifts should have gone to the AMC. <laughs> It's never too late, Andy. Right. Do you have any statistics as to how many couples met and married? I um, um, don't have any statistics on it, but um, uh, several different years during my tenure on, on um, the, February, the February edition of the magazine, there would be an article on, on recent weddings the past year um, due to people meeting through, um, through the organization. And th there would be 20 or 30 just in that year. Um, so I, I think if you look at the, the more general concept of how many people did we convert from people who were um, really not that interested in the outdoors to individuals that became really dedicated conservationists. It's not in the hundreds, it's in the thousands. Are more people hiking now than they used to be? Based, uh, based on the last two and a half hours I spent the, this afternoon on Lincoln's trails, I think uh, <laughs> absolutely yes. Uh, I, I only know my, my own observations, but it, it seems that there are two or three times as many people on the trails these days as, um, as normal. I, I, I don't know AMC statistics, but I, I know Mass Audubon has found a, um, just a, a real jump in membership in the, in the last year. And I think this is just a indication of people wanting to, wanting to get outside. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know here in Lincoln, the, the land trust has really had to go out of its way because of so many trails being overly crowded. So the answer, answer is definitely yes. Andy, I wanted to just ask if you had a favorite story of a couple that you knew that actually got together um, by way of the AMC. And I also just wanted to mention, I actually know two women who did the entire Appalachian Trail by themselves. Yeah. One, one for her 50th, one when she um, was taking a gap year between high school and college. Interesting. Um, we, we do have several several people we know in, uh, in Lincoln who, um, who, who have made it through the, um, the, whole, the whole trail too. Um, I, um, I don't know a, um, a specific story. I, um, I have attended um, only one wedding um, that was between two people who, who met through, um, through the AMC, but this is somewhat unique. They, they met through AMC because um, one of them was a, a professional fundraising consultant and the other person was a prospect. <laughs> Um, I um, um, don't know, again, whether AMC ended up as the beneficiary of any contribution, though, thanks to that relationship. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm trying to think of the, um, Jackie, you've got to fill in the name of our friend, um, who um, who through hiked the the AMC? Do you know who I'm thinking of? Katie Epstein. Yes. Oh right. Do we do we know any anybody here know someone else from Lincoln? Well, thank you, Andy. Sure. Just, you're up. Okay. Um, my husband is. I'm talking a little bit before because it's very long it's a long letter um my husband's recently been going through some papers and he found a letter that his mother wrote uh, well I'll, I'll now i'll start my timer um my husband's parents lived in germany until the war his father was jewish his mother was not 
They had one child at the time, Reynolds' sister, Yoa. His father anticipated the dire situation and left Germany in 1937 via Russia and various other countries, ending up in Detroit. I will only read a few parts of it because it's way too long. Um, and it may not be in sequence, but just bear with me. Uh, okay, so this is what she said. I arrived in New York for ha from Hamburg with only $2.50 in my purse. My husband having left Germany two years ahead of me was already established in Detroit doing research. Now, let me repeat, she wrote this all in English, a long typewritten letter, but she was German. Um, now this is not that now I'm going to explain something. Her first encounter was with discrimination towards blacks. When she booked her bus, the ticket person selling the ticket yelled white into the phone. Hannah Reynolds mother soon found out that that meant a negress who had to sit in the back of the bus. Long story short, she wrote really a full page on this. Um, the woman uh, was had to sit in the back of the bus, but the bus was practically empty. So she moved to a different seat and um, soon was escorted off the bus with her bags until she agreed to go to the back of the bus because they were just going to leave her by the side of the road. After this encounter, Hannah went on to say, um, just a little bit later in the story, just two more hours and I would see my husband, two more hours. I rose and counted my baggage, suitcase, packages, with which friends had given to her in New York. Um, I counted one, two, three, four, five, six. Sieben, somebody said from right behind her, said the strange woman in German, because I had counted in German. So the woman just gave the seven in German. Um, Turned out this woman was um, a Russian who also spoke German uh, and ended up sitting next to her. Um, she took a seat beside me and started a conversation. When I told her that I had not seen my husband for two years and was anxious, anxiously looking forward to meeting him, she gave me a curious side glance. Wait until you were there, she said. Because basically, her story 15 years before was she did the same thing. Her husband arrived at the bus station with his new girlfriend and basically dumped that Russian woman for the new girlfriend. So then Hannah Reynolds' mother said, you wait and see. I, oh, I'm already behind. Um, uh, you wait and see. She put on an air of confidence. My husband would not have asked me to join him, I said, if he did not want me. You wait and see, she said. Well, we would see. In half an hour, we, we would arrive in Detroit and I would show this woman my faithful husband. Well, long story short, the husband was not there. Um, and uh, the woman offered to take Hannah and her daughter, Yoa, who actually she never mentions in this letter at all, even though she was with her at the time and she was four, um, to, uh, to her son's house. And the son drove her over to, um, uh, drove her over to the house where the husband was. Um, and let me see if I can write that part. Um, the car stopped in front of a nice looking house. The couple went Wait, the lights inside the house went on. A woman peeped through the glass door. Your wife is here, doctor, she cried. Come, come. My husband opened the glass door and now I stood before him. We embraced each other. My postcard, which was supposed to announce my arrival had missed him and he had been waiting for me at another bus station. He took, me, he took my seven pieces of baggage and I took possession of our new home. Our new phase of our life in these United States began. So it's, uh, it was amazing, this letter. Uh, it's, there's many more pages to it, but um, it, was, it was very interesting. So that's it. If anyone has any questions, um, it's just amazing to be uprooted and have to start somewhere completely else with, well, language wasn't a problem. I think both of them spoke endless numbers of foreign languages. So Lucy, I had a question for you. So how long was she in transit from 
Germany to how long did it, it, it sounds like it was kind of, you know, a, it's a good question. She came on a boat. I don't know how long the boat took. I don't know how long she stayed in New York. Um, the problem is Reynolds sister is the one that knows everything. And she passed away a number of years ago. So we're, we're a little short on information, mm. but um, at least we did find out that Yoa was on the same boat. So, because at one point I'm thinking, well, how did Yoa get here? If we didn't know she was, you know. It takes five days. I came by boat, but later, of course. So who knows, it may have been slower in those yeah. days. Five days it was. Yeah, us. but she ended up with only $2.50. You know, it's, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. Lucy, it's Jenny. I have a question. Hey. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, you said that the father, I think the husband in the story, knew in 1937 to leave Germany, right? Yes. Do you know what, um, do you know anything about what made him decide that or? Well, there was already, uh, oh, you yeah. know, uh, the, the Jewish people were already in danger. Right. I just know that, you know, some people left and some people didn't. So I was curious if you had any more details about what in particular motivated him to, to, um, you know, leave. Yeah, no, I'll try to get those um, from, from my husband, if he can muster up the information, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yes, it, it took him a while to, um, to leave. And then he was a full on doctor. And mm -hmm. basically when he came to this country, he had to start over. He had to take um, wow. the medical boards. And instead of being a, a uh, well, I don't know what kind of a doctor he was, but the shortest mm -hmm. route to getting your degree, to getting a license was just to be a psychiatrist. So that's what he did. Mm. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. And I think just one more thing. I think there was always a feeling that that um, the persecution that happened in Germany could maybe happen in the States. So they, you know, they, they went to, you know, I think a, a universalist church. They didn't, you know, they didn't, um, you know, practice Judaism. They were just you know, laying low because they weren't sure. That's it. Thank you. Alana. Hello. Uh, okay, so my name is Alana Halstead. Um, I'm Judy Casarella's daughter and I haven't attended First Parish in a while but I grew up at First Parish. So I'm very excited to be seeing everyone again. Um, so let me get out my timer. I'm gonna be telling a story from one of my jobs. So I've worked over the years as a horseback trail guide at a couple different locations. And um, I'm gonna tell a story from the time I was in Mammoth Lakes, California, which is right outside of Yosemite. Um, it's like up in the Sierra Mountains. Okay, let me start my timer. All right, so. I was on a pack trail and the pack trail means it's an overnight ride. And this was the biggest pack trail our company had. So there's about 50 guests, about 10 guides. So we're heading back after the five days of overnight and I'm riding tail, I'm ponying the horse as well, which means I'm holding it as well as riding another horse. And I'm gathering up all the stragglers, making sure nobody gets left behind. And I'm falling behind with this one guy on one of our older horses. So he was on this older horse that us guides have been pushing to retire, which was half blind. So I'm wandering around in the mountains with an older gentleman, about 70 years old on a half blind horse. And I look out into the distance and I notice that we have fallen completely behind. I can barely see the head of the trail. I can't even see the rest of the pack. So I start calling out for people to hold the line and wait for us. I call and I call and I call, nothing. So there I find myself following a dust cloud in the middle of the California mountains with basically no idea where I'm going. No GPS, no phone, no walkie talkie. So 
So I turn to the man and I start to talk to him and ask him if he can trot because most of the riders were beginners, but we needed to catch up because horses don't left, like to be left behind either. So the horses are all getting anxious and the man does not say anything. He doesn't look at me. He doesn't respond. He makes no notion that he has hurt me. So I asked him again, still nothing. <laughs> so I'm just walking and walking. I start trotting up, trying to find someone, nothing. I come back to him and this goes on for about two hours and no one is there. Nobody can hear me. I'm screaming at the top of my lungs at this point. Every time I see someone pop over the hill and when you're in the desert, no one can hear you. You can't really tell how far away someone is, how close. And over and over again, I see someone pop up and they disappear. And this goes on and on and on. And this man has never responded to me once in a complete state of shock until eventually I come across a group of riders from our trail that were these more experienced endurance riders. And they'd gotten off their horses for a break. I finally, I wave them down. I start screaming. I'm so happy to finally have seen someone. And they get back on their horses and they start riding away. Wow. And my heart drops. I start screaming again. I'm like, please, somebody, do not leave me in the desert with a half blind horse and a man who can't seem to hear me. And thank God, one of the ladies turns around and sees me just melting down. She gets the group to stop. We ride up to them. I burst into tears. I am just having a full-blown panic attack. One of the women was a paramedic. She calms me down. They take the horse I was holding, take some deep breaths. And we find out as we're continuing on, because they also got left behind following the dust cloud that the man I was riding with, oh, that's three minutes, most of <laughs> The man I was riding with was an ex-Marine and he had gone to um, a PTSD episode and an old injury of his had acted up and he was trying the best he could not to pass out and fall off the horse. So we continue on and finally after, it was about a six hour ride in total and I fell behind about halfway through. So we had about half an hour left. We get back. I run to my boss. I'm like, what did you do? You left me behind. But no reaction. It was fine. And that's the end. They ended up calling the ambulance. And I never know what happened to that man. I wish I could talk to him. But it was an experience I'll never forget, thinking I was going to just get lost in the California mountains with a half blind horse and a man who wouldn't respond to me. So hey, that's one of my many trail guide stories. <laughs> I have to say that gave me goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> I usually like to tell it a lot slower, but then I realized I only had three minutes. So it's kind of a sped up version. So did you do the, that same job for years after that? Or did you keep doing that sort of thing? I still work as a trail guide. Um, I worked in Hawaii for a couple of years. And then this job, I had second and I was in Yosemite and I am going out to Yellowstone this summer. But I did not continue at that company. Um, I did not last long after that pack trail. I, I thought you were going to um, I thought you were going to finish the story by um, saying that um, you developed a romantic relationship with this guy, so it would <laughs> reinforce my concept. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I never he never said anything to me. It was pretty. I don't know when you're out in the middle of the desert and nobody's talking to you and no one can hear you. It's a very surreal experience. And, I guess I'll start talking to my horses. <laughs> I must say, Andy, you know, what you've taught us on the meditation walks about being sure that people make it around the corner and follow each other. That's what could have helped you out that day. <laughs> Alana. Oh, my. Yes. Oh, definitely. 
Alana, I just, um, my name is Jane. I'm a social worker and I just want to say, oh my God, your, your capacity to maintain focus and, and stay on point regardless of whatever was happening internally for you is remarkable. I mean, it's remarkable. You have a deep reservoir of, of strength and courage. It's really so impressive. I have no idea how old you were at the time that was happening, but clearly an old soul, really just super amazing. Well, I attribute that completely to horses. <laughs> I think this entire have... time I have two horses under me and one of them is just biting my boots the entire time, jumping around, whinnying for his the rest of his herd. Mm -hmm. So with oh. horses, it's, I've ridden horses my entire life. So I am pretty good at staying calm. I was about 18 at the time. Ridiculous. That's amazing. Lana, it, it's Jenny. Um, you, you're, you, that man was so lucky that he had you. You might not know who he is. I don't know if he knows who you are, but he was really, really lucky that he was in your company. Thank you. It's, yeah. I was very torn throughout the entire I think, it was, I think it was about two hours, I want to say. I'm not really sure. Um, but it was, it's a very um, confusing experience of if you should leave the person and try and find help or mm -hmm. just stick with them. Yeah. You, um, you, you may know there's a, um, a horrible um, Sierra Club story about a, a hiker in the, um, in the desert. Um, and um, in, in this case, she was... Um, she was left alone, and when they came back, she had uh, she had died. Um, it, it just was just a a horrible lesson in teaching that you you never want to to leave someone on their own. Yeah, especially with with horses, they do not like to be left alone. So best to stick together. Alana. I, I've never heard, you've never told me that story actually. And it's quite different from many of the other kind of amusing story you've told about tourists that you've taken on trail rides. So, yeah, well, most of my stories are- They're more funny. More uplifting of tourist stupidity or horse ignorance. But um, yeah, I thought that was a entertaining story to yeah, tell here. Story, I, I didn't know you can't tell what was wrong. You didn't know what was wrong, so. One of our topics, ideas for Sit, Talk, Learn is to tell a story that you wouldn't have told your mother. <laughs> so this <laughs> just happened. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Would you like to introduce Jacqueline? Yes, so next up we have my best friend in the entire world, Jacqueline LeFerriere who attended church school with me. I don't even know how long we were there, 10 years, <laughs> forever. So, here's to Jacqueline. Thanks, Alana. Um, so, hi, I'm Jacqueline LaFerriere. Um, I'm Deanna's daughter. I recognize a lot of you. I also grew up at First Parish, so um, it's nice to be here. Um, I don't really have a story. I'm just gonna actually talk about um, kind of Alana and I's friendship through the years and give some very brief highlights of stories. Um, but yeah, so you can start the timer now. Why can't I get her in the middle? Double click. Okay. So as I've gotten older, my feelings on the term best friend have changed a lot. Since my time as a young girl, when that label seemed to get thrown around all the time, I've learned so much more about the different kinds of love and the unique beauty that each friendship can bring into our lives. Love can't be measured or labeled one better over another. But when I do say those words, it's for Alana and only her. I, she's the only person in the world that I've ever reserved the title of best friend for. It's a special privilege to be able to say that I've known someone outside of my family for my whole life. And I never take it for granted. And she's that person for me. Our mothers met in a mommy and me class when we were babies and the rest is history. Alana and her family are an extension of my own. And we've both changed so much throughout the time of knowing each other and we'll, we'll continue to, but there's a comfort in knowing that there's someone out there who has seen me 
and all the various me's that there have been and hasn't left. <laughs> this is a story time about the mayhem that we used to get into as children. I couldn't capture how devilish we were and how much stress we put our parents through in three minutes, but I can give you some highlights. We created far off worlds full of storylines and characters beyond belief in the comfort of our living rooms. We walked through a tick nest and spent hours naked in the yard when we were five as our patient caregiver picked all the ticks off of our tiny bodies. We ate all the food in the house all the time. We got sick of each other and had fistfights and wrestled. We jumped on Alana's parents' bed and knocked the screen out of the skylight above us. I need Alana square in her nose and gave her a nosebleed when I slid down a slide once. I don't remember that story, but I believe it. We got fights in over, we got into fights over who was taller. It was always me until it very suddenly wasn't me. One of the only times I can feel how it used to feel to inhabit my body when I was a child is when I picture hugging Alana. We never wanted to say goodbye when we were kids at the end of our play dates. And we would always give each other sweet long hugs every time we had to part for the day. I can vividly remember how it felt to be so small and to hold on to each other so tightly and to squish our faces together. I still feel it every time we hug today. We've stayed best friends through switching schools and through moving across the country, but we always end up coming back to each other in some way. I can't wait to live our futures together and continue to witness each other becoming who we are becoming. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. That was so beautiful. <laughs> I love you so much. The light of my life. Oh, I didn't read that to Alana beforehand. <laughs> yeah. You did make me cry a little. Oh. I know it's Great not really a story. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I think there's nothing more beautiful than a, a friendship that covers an arc of a life and to grow up and go through all those twists and turns together and still land together. Uh -huh. um, bear witness, as you said, to each other. It's uh -huh. beautiful and really generous of you to share that with us. Thank you both. That was really beautiful. Any other questions? Jacqueline, what did you do when she moved, when Alana moved to Hawaii? <laughs> I was so sad. <laughs> yeah, it was hard. We were like 14 when that happened. Um, and yeah, we would FaceTime a lot and it was hard because we were like in transformative years, but I think it was kind of good for us in a way to like grow up at that time apart and then come back together. Where do you both live now? Well, I'm currently in Ithaca, New York because I go to Ithaca College um, and Alana's living in Northampton. All right. Yeah. Not too far, I get out there. <laughs> Wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for listening. Uh, let's see, Rick Gordon. You are up with a little, um, I'm going to invite Wynn Quayle first to speak and to introduce you to the group. Thanks, Tucker. Um, well, I've spoken about this sometimes before. If you've heard it, um, you know the story that after my mother died at the age of 94, uh, a few years ago, I discovered that I have an older half brother that I never knew existed. And I've talked a little bit about the experience of getting to know him, but Rick is here today to tell you about the experience from his point of view. So thanks for coming, Rick, and take it away. Okay, all right. So th thank you, Wynn. This is, uh, it's been a very interesting last uh, last three years, uh, uh, meeting Wynn and, and also uh, uh, our sister, uh, Sharon, who's also uh, on, the, on the Zoom call from New York. So, uh, this is sort of funny. I don't know all of the things that Wynn has shared. So I'll just sort of say, this is a, 
uh, like a, a personal uh, story, like finding your roots. If you've seen that uh, PBS uh, show, yes. which uh, my wife Susie and I adore, it's really very interesting. Yes, I like uh, it. And today, it's sort of funny, on Sunday, today on uh, the, the Sunday show that we enjoy, uh, an author talking about a, a, a book, uh, American Baby, which uh, when Sister Sharon sent to me about a month ago, which has got a great story about an adopted uh, uh, adoptee who went through things and finally did actually be just he passed away he was able to to meet his biological mom but it's a, it's the story of that mom and dad and i very well written and when gave me a book uh when i first uh, met him in, in person called the girls who went away which is also that in the 40s and 50s uh, millions of sent away and and, uh, and in my case uh, the biological mom uh, did not really see me probably uh, past uh, past giving birth. I know I was adopted at birth, and uh, my, my adopted mom and dad uh, uh, said told me that they met uh, they met Wynn's mom uh, as uh, she was leaving the uh, uh, the hospital in Portland, Maine, where I was born. So it's. Uh, uh, it's really interesting. I did, since I knew I was adopted from birth, and it never was. Uh, I never thought about it as a big thing. I was raised as an only child, which I, I regret, but that's that's just the way a lot of people are. Uh, to talking to Andrew, uh, I didn't see a mountain until I was uh, 18 and went up to uh, upstate New York to college. Uh, I have done the uh, southern portion of the Appalachian Trail and uh, a couple hundred miles in the uh, Philmont Scout Ranch in uh, New Mexico. So uh, I've gotten to see some mountains, but uh, didn't see them at all growing up. I'm just a beach boy. And um, my wife, Susie, who's here with me, uh, we live on Pensacola Beach right now, which is a, a white sand beach on the Gulf of Mexico. So let me see, what would be interesting to know? Uh, when when uh, Wayne and I discovered each other, uh, I had, uh, Let's see, I found out, this is the sort of the, uh, the investigation story. I, I had a piece of paper from my stepbrother that had uh, the name of uh, Jane Wingate, the mother's name, uh, the town where she was from in Connecticut, Windsor Locks, and the name of the doctor who uh, assisted in the birth. Of course, this was, you know, that was 40 years later. So I went to that town in Connecticut because I was working in the Northeast from time to time as a consultant. And I asked for a, a, a birth record and I, the town clerk gave me one. This was about 2000. And then I then I happened to think, I said, I wonder if she got married here. So I asked for uh, if, she, if the clerk had a marriage record and they had. So that's how I found out the last name Quail. I wouldn't have had that information otherwise. And uh, then I was able to do a, a, a simple internet search and her address in New Hampshire showed up uh, because back in 2000, we weren't hiding information as much as we do now. And so I, I wrote to her and, uh, and uh, said, I'd like to, I don't want to disrupt your life or, or anything, but I would like to meet you. I'd like to know, you know, basic health information. And uh, she was not interested in meeting me. Uh, so we exchanged, I used to send her birthday cards and uh, our anniversary cards. And, uh, and then uh, one card that I sent in late 2017, uh, Wynn got and, and returned and, and, and said that uh, mom had passed away. And so I responded to him and we've struck up a relationship since then, he and I, and as well as uh, Sharon, uh, his sister. And there's one other sister in California. So it's it's been it's been a, a great a great situation for me to uh, meet uh, you know others other another family, and uh, I have uh, with the help of Sharon about a year ago, uh, we found uh, my biological dad, and uh, the biological dad's family was from Harvard, Mass, which is near where you all are. Wayne is in Cambridge and and was in Lincoln, so it's incredible that uh, the, the, the both sides of my biological past are, are close by there. The other coincidences are that uh, I wound up going to Rensselaer uh, for college 
that's where Wynn's dad went to, went to uh, college. Uh, and uh, mom, Jane, went to Skidmore, which is 20 miles away from, uh, uh, from Troy, New York, where Rensselaer is. And so I actually went to Skidmore a couple of times as a undergraduate looking for a date. And uh, furthermore, uh, Wynn's dad was in the same fraternity that I uh, at Rensselaer, you know, obviously, you know, a few years later, but, but so there were some funny things. I, I worked in Boston for a year when I was in college. Uh, I'm sure I was, I was around uh, Copley Square quite a bit. Uh, the Prudential Center was brand new in the 60s. So uh, we've had a lot of similarities. My wife uh, says that I look like mom uh, partially and I look like dad partially. So uh, it's been great for me. I mean, I had a great growing up uh, in terms of, you know, loving parents. Uh, my dad was Jewish. Um, my mom was not, uh, but she adopted it. Uh, it was a second marriage for both of them. So, uh, so I grew up uh, on Miami Beach uh, uh, with a lot of kids from the Northeast who, uh, whose families had moved down there after World War II. And uh, that's probably, probably why I'm a beach boy. So uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions. It's, uh, yeah, I worked all around the country, uh, done some different things. I've, I've been teaching online the last uh, 10, 15 years. I'm about to hang that up because I think it's time to just uh, retire and enjoy things and, uh, and learn how to play the guitar better. So questions are, are welcome for whatever you'd like to know. Well, I, I just have perhaps just a comment to make. Wynn brought the first part of this story to a SIP Talk Learn, I think, two years ago. And at that point, he had received the return of the Christmas letter from you and began the conversation about beginning to know you. And then later on, perhaps that year or the next year, raised the question of your being in pursuit of making sure you had your dad's um, identity firmly recognized in your history. So we've all been rooting for you now for <laughs> okay. more than two years uh -huh. um, and are delighted to hear that the story has come together so beautifully. Yeah, the shame, the shame is, of course, that mom had passed away. So I really never, uh, other than um, things that Wynn and Sharon have shared with me, in, including some videos uh, and pictures, lots of pictures and, and photograph albums, didn't really ever face the face uh, for her good benefit as well as mine. And uh, uh, the biological dad uh, passed away in 2006. So uh, he was about my size, as I found out. I'm six six, uh, but uh, you know he's he's uh, got a son, one son, Larry, who uh, in Harvard, Mass. And Susie and I have met him. He's a, you know his same age as Win. Uh, very nice fellow, and uh, it's been great for me though, just to meet some new family. Not not to say anything about the Gordons. I mean my. My stepdad, my stepbrother who passed away had three children and they're, they're like uh, younger brothers and sisters to me and they're scattered around the country. So in my, my three kids, uh, the three kids that Susie and I have, uh, they're in Dallas and Seattle and, and, and Fairfield, Connecticut. So uh, ge geography has been a, a bane of my existence. I would say that because uh, uh, nowadays people travel without at the drop of the hat, but I grew up in, a, in an environment where you know, long distance travel was was uh, rare and expensive. Great story. Any other questions? Thanks, Thanks for having me. You're welcome. I mean, I'd, uh, it's. Uh, uh, I think you guys have a great a great community. I'm just as a, as a for information. Uh, uh, the temple that I'm in down here, we do a couple of things online with groups that are uh, somewhat similar, uh, but different. So I'll share them. One is called, uh, we do it on a monthly basis. We call it Torah on Tap. And the way Torah on Tap works, it used to be in person, but it's been Zoom the last year. Uh, you know, we pick a subject, whether it be uh, typically a, a subject like immigration or, uh, or, or uh, giving or uh, 
you know, maybe some political, maybe some sociological. And uh, we'll, we call it Torah on Tap because we'll meet at five o'clock and we'll we'll uh, share a, a beer or a glass of wine or a cup of coffee or a cocktail for a half hour. And then from 5.30 to 6.30, we'll talk about whatever the subject is. Uh, so the, the last, uh, I think the last time uh, we had it, uh, the t discussion was, what does freedom mean to you? And so it's, a, it's, 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 it's interesting. And, uh, and uh, the rabbi who leads it uh, does, you know, the, they, you know, all clergy have the benefit of the internet and they, he can do a search and pull up uh, a dozen quotations and things from the Bible about whatever the subject is. And then so we can have a basis for starting a discussion. Uh, and then we do something else uh, on a weekly basis that's somewhat similar, but for a smaller group. But it's interesting, uh, Zoom allows you to do, uh, you know, to, to attend things in any place in the country. And uh, for that matter, uh, further than that, and of course, I teach online, so I'm used to it. But thank you. I think this is a great, uh, a great uh, way to have some short talks. I'm going to suggest that to my uh, temple. Well, thank you again for joining us. It's been a thrill to hear, hear the story on a stretched out basis. Um, next is Cynthia Richer. And Cynthia is going to tell us a story of her life. Well, the very beginning of my life, pretty much. Um, I'm going back, way back to when I was uh, very young and it lived in a suburb of Philadelphia and attended Germantown Friends School, a Quaker school in that city. Um, I was there uh, from four-year-old kindergarten until graduation. And our school had on its grounds the Quaker meeting house of the town where our upper school held Quaker meetings that, uh, for the, and um, that was every Thursday morning. Uh, also through the school, the school sponsored weekend work camps in the city um, where we, we essentially went into the inner city and helped people fix up their houses and uh, paint them uh, so that I had that ex Quaker kind of experience as well. Um, my teachers um, and the school valued all people, all humanity, and referred often to the Quaker spirit, a belief that there's God in every person. Uh, I was a junior at GFS when the nearby George School invited us to, and our affiliated French school, to join them and their two affiliated German schools for a summer work camp in Dorlar, Germany, which was a very small village. Um, remember, this was 1951, not very long after World War II, and I, I had very strong memories myself from experiencing blackouts, gas and food shortages, and my own childhood fears of the Germans and the Japanese. But I was eager when I heard about this work camp possibility to go. My parents, it turned out, were opposed and concerned for me to be where I might, in Germany, where I might not be able to get out, they thought. Um, but they finally said yes, relented, and I, with two classmates, were chosen to go. So we were on a huge, huge student ship. They had them back then. I don't know if they do now. Full of stu students. We, it was called the Volendam, and we we had a song, we had a, a musical performance and I was in the chorus and we sang, uh, there is nothing like the dam. And that, that was the boat. We crossed the Atlantic and uh, my school group, 
Germantown Friends School kids and a French teacher went to Falaise, France for a few days. Um, and there, the first thing that they wanted us to do was go to see the dug trenches that were outside of the town and up a hill uh, where when the sirens wailed, uh, they had to run and, and hide. Um, it, was, it was quite a way of meeting our, our people from our affiliated school. Um, after that, I went to Dusseldorf to meet some of the other kids. I was met um, at the train station by two handsome boys who, who were there um, with a bike. Uh, and it was for me to ride. It was early morning and we rode silently through Dusseldorf in the dawn light, which was red, the sky was red and the buildings were, were uh, not rubble, but, but clearly broken down and, and unusable. Uh, we went to the, the boy's house and uh, tired, I took a nap and woke up to jazz sounded like American jazz, but one of the boys was playing it on, the, on their piano. Um, the father of that house, I have a sore throat. I don't know if, if you can hear it or not, but it's hard to talk. Uh, the father of that house, in a conversation that we were having, said we didn't realize what we were doing and I knew by the context that it, he meant to the Jews. And uh, again, that was something I've always remembered um, and pondered. <laughs> then on to Dorlar, the small village where the work camp would be held. There were 17 students gathering there from these three countries and five teachers. Um, it was a very small village with a paved, I think, main street with a tavern at the bottom of the street and a Lutheran church at the top with an orphanage there, war orphans. Um, the jobs that we had, it was a beautiful little village um, and, and nice to be there. The jobs that were assigned to us each they were assigned to us by the Lutheran pastor. Um, we collected water from a fast running stream for whatever we needed, when, for whatever purposes that was needed for water. <laughs> we trimmed hedges, repaired dirt roads, we peeled potatoes ad infinitum, we mended children's clothes, we did carpentry work and some painting, and we played with the children, and there are many of them. We worked hard and happily. It was a good time, and a peaceful time, until one night. And that night, the Germans, the three German boys, painted swastikas on their dormitory walls and proclaimed to whoever could hear them, that the Third Reich shall return. Um, that clearly was uh, a roadblock for us. What happened was that the girls were living in barracks across some railroad tracks, and a teacher came and told us what had happened. Um, and told us essentially to stand by until the walls were clean. And then we were all to meet in the, what we called the gathering room for breakfast and some real talk together about the incident and probably for a short Quaker meeting. Um, 
So we did that. And yes, the boys apologized openly and sincerely. And we all shared and we, we listened and we forgave and we apologized. And life continued at the camp and it still seemed peaceful and good and useful. Now, many, many, many years later, there are three Quaker um, phrases that I cherish still. And I take from those years at the uh, Quaker camp that I went to and from that time in Dorlar, Germany. And these are the phrases. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. Live simply and live and there is that of God in everyone. And that's my story. Any thoughts or questions? Cynthia, when we've talked about this before, I mean, I, one, of the, one, one of the things that you've mentioned was that in your Quaker meetings within this group that you didn't think that you'd ever really address the subject of the war very directly and that, um, that this was really the first time that you were able to do that. I'm not sure about that because it was so long ago, but I think that's true. I think we really, I think particularly we, we, during the whole time, we were a little concerned, not a little, a lot concerned about how the French and Germans were relating to each other, but we didn't feel that ourselves. Um, uh, my, my friend that went with me from my school, we both had really nice German boyfriends <laughs> and they didn't at all feel like the enemy. Mm. But uh, it was a, quite an experience. Cynthia, have you ever gone back there? I've gone to reunions, but not recently. Mm. And uh, I try whenever I talk to someone who lives in any of my friends in Philadelphia who've been there, I try to ask them, how GFS is now, and and it sounds as though it's the same. Um, we, we studied and worked hard, but but the sense of the religion and the fact that Germantown's meeting house was right on our property and we used it was very special. So so I've I've gone back, but not for a long time. Cynthia, this is Jenny Rankin. Hi. Um, I'm wondering when you went over to Germany as a teenager uh, in 1951, what would Americans have been told about the extent of the Holocaust at that at that point in time? What, was it known that that many Jews had died or what was the general? I don't know. We had Jews in our school. We didn't have blacks. Um, I can't tell you, I don't remember talking about it, but it, it might have been brought up in Quaker meeting. Mm -hmm. um, or it might have been brought up elsewhere. Um, I think I learned more over time than there, maybe. Mm -hmm. There's a book about the New York Times. Um, I think it's a couple of years old, but it's about the, I mean, I'm interested in to what extent Americans newspapers were reporting. I mean, we're, we're told that, you know, Roosevelt and various people knew basically what was going on in terms of Jews being murdered. But I, I'm, I'm wondering what the general American population, what, what people kind of knew and when they knew it. And I just wondered if by 1951, um, our, our school was so open. The motto was, was um, behold, you know, the behold I hold before thee an open door. 
And to me, that meant keep your mind open. We don't need prejudices, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, experiment, try things. Right. I just, I just meant, you know, that the factual knowledge of 6 million Jews being, being exterminated. I, I just, it, you know, it's now established, but was it, was it known back then? That's what I was interested in. Mm-hmm. It sounds like you're, you're not sure. This is Rachel and I can say about what was happening in England immediately after the war, the news, we would have the news and the beginning of the news, we would be, we would see, and I was very young, and I remember this very clearly, the death camps, and the uh, the bodies, and it had an enormous effect on me. If you went to the cinema, you had the new, the pathy news, and then bum 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 bum, and then they would show pictures of the death camps, and I saw all of that in 1940 six, probably 45, 46. So of course it was known by 50, 1950, almost definitely. And yeah. Rick, did you have something to say? Well, I was just gonna say that Eisenhower and some other generals who uh, liberated the uh, different camps, uh, uh, you know, chronicled with photographs and videos what was there, and 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 as Rachel just said, uh, they were shown on um, newsreels at uh, cinemas yes. and, and and a variety of things. I think, in, in general, a lot of uh, U.S. service people who who were in the war in in, in either Pacific or, or Europe, they came back, and people didn't talk about it. My my uh, my mom and dad didn't talk about. It. They didn't. They were too old to serve, but they didn't. They didn't talk about the the war, and I think that's true for a lot. The 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 really horrible thing today is, according to at least to some surveys, I don't know if the surveys are any good, but supposedly twenty or thirty percent of the American population thinks that uh, the Holocaust didn't didn't happen. You know, and so I don't know if that's a real number or not, but that's what I've heard reported, and that's a shame if it's true. Yeah, I've heard that as well. It's it's very disturbing. Thank you, Cynthia, for sharing with us. And last but not least, Sarah Cannon Holden. All right, we'll 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 switch to a lighter note. Um, let me just make one introduction. I told my grandchildren um, that when they turned ten, I would take them on a week's adventure. And so, in the spring of two thousand eighteen, Cannon, the eldest, asked to go to see the wild ponies at Chincoteague and Assateague. That's another story for another day. Now you can start the clock. Um, Next up was the summer of of 2019 with Roan and McLean, cousins, West Coast boy and East Coast girl, and their best friends. Larry came with us this time. The first stop was Glacier National Park in, in Montana to see Mount Cannon named after these kids' great-great-grandparents who had climbed it as Goat Mountain in 1901. Their note, left in a bottle at the top, was found in the 1980s. I arranged to meet with the park archivist to see the note. My grandfather carefully wrote that my grandmother was the first to the top. Smart of him to do that. The children listened in awe. We then left to hike to Avalanche Lake on this blistering hot day in July. Roan and McLean took off, racing and jumping over roots and rocks, hiding behind boulders and bends in the trail, jumping out to surprise us. As streams, they, at streams, they swung on fallen trees and leaped from rock to rock. At the lake, they jumped in fully clothed and quickly jumped out. It was absolutely freezing. Second stop was to fish the Kootenai River in Northwest Montana. The kids hauled in fish after fish when they weren't jumping off the boat and into the river or running along the shore collecting stones to toss into the water. The guide delighted in their enthusiasm. We visited the Kootenai National Wildlife Refuge in Northern Idaho. Historically, the land was nurtured by the native people 
who worked with the season cycles, including floods. In the 1920s, non-natives built dams and the land changed. McLean took pictures of hummingbirds and, and bald eagles. On our way south to Coeur d'Alene, we stopped at an information center, which was an enormous mistake. The kids discovered two important sites to visit, a shooting range and an amusement park. They pressed us into submission. <clears throat> By the time they had finished hitting the bullseye at 50, 150 and 200 yards, the male gun enthusiasts were speechless. Neither child had ever handled a gun before. We hoped we could avoid the amusement park, but we failed. Next day, lunch was in Kellogg, Idaho, a silver mining town in the past, and later a Superfund site. High school students worked with others to bring back their town, now a ski area. We took the lift to the top of the mountain where bikers were practicing for a race. Our third planned and final stop was Mullen, Idaho, at the start of the Hiawatha, Hiawatha Rail Trail. On rented bikes, we set off on a 15 mile high ride high in the mountain wilderness. Roan and McLean took off through the first of 11 tunnels. The height of the seven trestles took our breaths away. We descended gradually, but a fast pace along the trail and around the gentle corners. On the way back through the initial two mile tunnel, the kids discovered that the, that the faster they pedaled, the muddier they got. Roan and McLean did not slow down, nor did we. By the end of the day, we were all covered in mud, tired, ready for a shower and happy and grateful to have been together. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> well, I'm just um, really impressed that you've taken these trips with your grandchildren. I mean, what a special gift to give them, really. It was. Yeah, when we went to Chincoteague and Assateague, there was one um, foal. And by pure good luck, we found it. So that was very, very exciting for Canon, who absolutely adores horses. Now, now, Sarah, go over again how the decisions are made on where you get to visit. Well, partly the kids, oh, totally with Canon, her decision. And then the kids wanted to go fishing. I really wanted to go to Glacier to Mount Cannon. I, I really, because I was in touch and I thought, oh, there's this bottle, there's this note, I'd like to see it. Larry and I had actually climbed that mountain um, for our honeymoon and there are two peaks and we'd gone up one so we did not find the bottle, unfortunately. But it was found later. And the Hiawatha Trail was mine. That's where I wanted to go. Larry's a big fisherman. But um, I wanted, and the Hiawatha Trail, if you ever can do it, it is one of the most spectacular places and bike rides you could possibly imagine. It is wilderness beyond where there is nothing except this old railroad bed. And um, I mean, literally the trestles are so high, it, it makes you shake. They're so unbelievable. So, and the kids just, these are two children who are, as I said, very good friends. They just love each other and they, um, they spur each other on and they, 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 I mean, we just had an absolutely glorious time with them, absolutely. And then at the end, I flew home to take Roan to California to, with McLean. McLean and I took him home to California. We spent 36 hours there. And then McLean and I flew back across the country and actually we got to Boston and took, a, took the tea to Alewife and took a cab home. And then we looked at each other and said, well, now what do you wanna do? And she said, well, I wanna take a shower. And I said, okay. And then she said, let's keep going. Well, she lives in Vermont. So at 6.30 or seven after that day, I drove, we drove to Vermont. 
and uh, got her home. But she had a book that Larry had given her, I think, of uh, brain teasers. So the whole way up, she was reading from that. And we were brain teasing each other. So the, the ride went, and the three hours went in no time at all. So that was the end of the story. <laughs> it was great. Any other questions? Well, I think this another successful SIP Talk Learn. I thank you all who spoke and those who came and listened. And um, we will plan again for winter of next year. And hopefully we can be together in, in the Stern's room again. So be thinking of your next story. RL already texted me a couple of ideas he got while listening to your stories. Um, and um, I hope to hear from you all in the end. Um, but thank you so much. And um, thank you, Lucy, for trying to keep us on time. Yeah, I it gave was, up on that. It was a tough day for that, but it was well <laughs> worth listening, I think, to all the stories. And um, Rick, I hope you come back. And Darlene, you come back too and listen. And um, Sharon, uh, come and, and listen to us next time. Um, okay. Adele, yes. Okay. Yes. Are you saying that you won't be meeting until next winter? That's the plan, because okay. usually we do it um, in the winter time. Okay. When, the, when the weather gets good, it's kind of harder to get people to come on. I mean, if you all think we should do one in April, we certainly could. Um, but um, I just was thinking that, you know, people are going to want to be outside. Yep, I think so. Thanks, Tucker, for all that you do okay. for these. Oh, well, it's, it's fun. Um, and we have uh, we have a lineup for next time. A couple of people who I who I tried to get for this one who said they'd be next time. So um, uh, we hope well, some of you will join us as well. Any other questions? Thanks, Tucker. Thank well, you, Tucker. Yeah. Pleasure. Great, great, great story. Great, great job, Tucker. Listen. Take care. Go out and enjoy the rest of the sunshine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Tucker. Thank you, Tucker. You're welcome. Thank you, RL, for managing. Thanks, RL, Tucker, and Lucy. Thanks. Thank you all. Thanks, Tucker.